Good evening, my brother Botai. We are continuing on our series of Misalad Yasharim, and tonight we are actually starting the first perek. We finished the preface, the Akdama of Misalad Yasharim, and now we're going to actually start the official prakim, which he at the end of. The Haktama, he mentioned the Braitav of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, the nine steps to greatness, the ladder of growth towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of Torah Meviali de Zerizud, Zerizud Meviali de Zerizud, Zerizud Meviali de Zerizud, and the Kiyut, and so on and so forth, up the ladder of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But here in the first Perek, he's going to take some time to explain what is the focus of a person in this world. What is our life summarized in Olam Azeh before we hit the nine steps to greatness? What exactly is our situation in the world? To me, this is one of the most, if not the most per important perek of the entire Mesil Sharim. If a person would be to just review this perek his entire life and ponder and every single word that he writes, it would be something worthwhile doing. Is an important again. We mentioned before that the the Gra, the Vilnagaon writes the first ten chapters of of Mesilat Sharim doesn't have an extra word in it. And it's a tremendous thing the way he has written it, the way he has put it together. Every word is what to learn, and we're going to focus, try to analyze, try to um, dissect things that he writes and things that he is hitting at Bezrat Hashem together. So he writes. What is the general obligation that a person has in his world? And he says, Yesot Chasidut, the foundation of Chasidut, which again, Chasidut is the sixth out of the nine steps that he's going to dedicate the entire Sefer of Mr. Sharim to, but he also uses it as the general terminology for a great Jew. For a person that wants to do La Asod Nachat Ruach Liyotzro, he wants to do the will of Hashem, he wants to get close to, to the Almighty, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so it's, as a general term, that great level of, of Jewish connection with Hashem is also called Chasidut, and he's using it now in that general term of the Yesod of Chasidut, the foundation. Yesod means a foundation, a platform upon which you build something. The Yesod, the foundation of Hasidut, of being that Jew with all of the amazing things that go through building a Jew, and the root of complete avodah towards Hashem, complete service of Hashem. Now, for Hasidut, he uses the word Yesod for Avodah Shalema uses the language Shor. Shor means the root. Root means it's what creates the sustenance, what feeds the growth of a tree or a plant. It's not just mere base, but it really is what uh, sustains the entire growth, the entire plant. So the root of a proper Avodah to Hashem. Why does he use different words? To me, it seems like when, when you're building Yesot HaChasidut, when you're building Chasidut, which means you're doing a lot of amazing things. You're growing, you are developing yourself as a personality that, that does things that a Chasid does. But you have to have a platform. You have to have what to build upon. If you don't have a, a deep uh, foundation, you cannot build a tall building. The more when you see the, they're digging and, and, and pouring foundation, the deeper they dig, you already know that the taller the building is going to be. That's just how it works. You need something to stand the building on to be able to build. You need foundation. And in building of a personality, you need also foundation. You need a proper platform. You can't just start building. When was the last time you saw they knocked down a house and they just started building? You have to dig, you have to flatten, you have to put platform cement, you have to have a foundation for the building. If you don't have foundation, you don't have a sturdy building. But every piece that you build is a piece of building by itself. 
it needs to stand on something, but it is something of reality by itself. It doesn't necessarily need um, the, the foundation for it to exist. It's not going to have longevity, it's not going to stand. It can't be a proper building without it, but the, the units, every brick, it could be valuable by itself. So, so is to the Hasidut. When you do mitzvah, when you do things that are the makeup of a Hasid, a connected Jew, you're doing actions of, of um, perfection that are valuable on their own. But you need a platform for it, which is what he's going to explain. Now, by avodah temima, by a per perfect avodah connection to Hashem, that's a matter of heart. If you do a mitzvah, and there's no heart in it, we explained this before in the preface, the hakdama, that a person could do, do a mitzvah and it will be like ma'asekhof ba'alma, it will be like a monkey doing something that's trained to do. If there is no heart, if there is no mind, it's just doing of the mitzvah robotically out of routine, a mitzvah anashim melumada, that to that degree takes away from the value of the mitzvah to the degree that it could become worthless almost. So therefore, you need sustenance for it to live. For avodah, it's a constant sustenance. Now, what is this sustenance? What is the root of avodah atimima? What is the platform as a yesod, as a foundation of building a Jew? Is the following. Sheyit barer. I'm not going to pause on every word. I'm going to read just the sentence and then we're going to come back to every word. It should become clear and it should become true. To a person, what is his obligation in his world? And to, towards what does he need to put his outlook and his goal and purpose in all the things that he works hard during the entire lifetime what does he have to focus on what does he have to put his purpose on now there are a lot of things that he alludes to in, in this little two lines and let's go through them just on a surface level says the Mistati Sharim there are two things that need to happen, not just one. You have to have clarity of what exactly my goal is in life. If you don't have clarity where you're headed, then there's no way that you're going to have a, a proper pursuit of that which will bring you to your perfection. No way that's going to happen. If you have no clarity of what path you got to take, you got to go a little bit here, a little bit there, deviate, take a tangent. If you don't know clearly where you're headed, you know, generally speaking, you know, I, I, I want to be a good man. That's a very vague thing. Define good. Where there is no, if you don't go with the divine inspired um, direction, there's no good. Good is subjective. Well, uh, 40, 50 years ago, 80% of the, the medical faculty and doctors, they felt that abortion is murder. And if you assist that, you're also a murderer. You're a bad person. Today, perhaps the majority, I don't have the numbers, but perhaps over 70, 75%, they will tell you that, well, it's the rights of the mother. And it's an act of compassion. And if you don't understand that you're a cruel man, you're bad. So you see, in just in our lifetime, it has changed to to complete diametrically opposed, a complete 180. So you have no clarity of what good means even necessarily if you don't have a clarity. If you don't know objectively what is, what's my purpose? What do I want to do exactly? What is good for me? So that's considered sheyit barir. You have to have clarity on it. Now, that by itself is at all not enough. Because a, a person could know something on a knowledge base, yidi'ah, but 
it's not connected with how he lives his life. Have you ever seen a doctor that smokes? Now you'll tell him, you know, he knows all the, all the research and all the pictures of a long, of a smoker, a long, of a healthy athlete that doesn't smoke, the lifespans, the charts, the curves, he knows all of that. But it is something missing from the connection of an intellectual conviction to a heartfelt c conviction that we're going to live now our life based on this. And that connection does not exist in every person. There are a whole lot of things that we know are not good for us. A large percent of Americans, they suffer from, from diabetes, from, you know, fatty liver that could, could cause cirrhosis, could, could kill you, or many other things that are bad. Addiction to this, addiction to that, internet phone, <laughs> substance, alcohol, And many other things. I'm, I'm just trying to think quick and give examples of things that we live with in our society. Many of those who are subject to these things, they know it's bad. You ask them, bad, good, they say, absolutely bad. They could even give a lecture as an intellectualite on how bad it is. But when it comes to action, there is a disconnect. In terminology of, of Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, V'yadata hayom, v'hashevota el levavecha ki Hashem hua elokim. In the mitzvah of emunatu Hashem, that we have been commanded, there are two elements that the Pasuk mentions. V'yadata hayom, and you shall know, Yediyah is a very high level of knowledge. The highest level of knowledge is Yediyah. V'yadata hayom, dat, I mean, Chochma Bina Vadaat the Vilna Gaon writes, we ask this for, for this in every Tfilah of Shemun that we did, we daven. And so therefore it's important to understand what we daven for. The, the Gaon, in the beginning of his Perush and Mishle, explains Chochma is the knowledge and understanding, full understanding of the raw material. That's Chochma. Then Bina is the ability of taking different elements of the knowledge that I have, comparing them, putting them together, and draw new conclusions based on different pieces of chokhmah, of knowledge. So now that's a new level. Lehavin davar mitoch davar, that's bina, to understand something from other raw material, raw information. And that is the, the subtotal of a person's understanding based on Chochman. Bina gives example that you have a father and a mother, the child would be that. If Chochman and Bina are the, the parents, the, the subtotal of that as a new creation is that. That is the highest level of understanding. But Vyadata Hayom is not enough. That's what it starts with. You have to know that Hashem exists. Ki Hashem Elokim. That there's Hashem, there's Elohim, they're one and the same. We're not discussing what exactly that mitzvah of emunah is because out of, out of the, our topic, immediate topic right now, but it's just touching on v'yadata ayom, but that's not enough. V'hashevot ha'elevavecha. You have to bring that down and connect it with your heart. V'hashevot ha'elevavecha. You have to bring it to a reality of your life, we would call it. In other words, and knowledge does not necessarily turn into a reality in your life if you don't work on it. There are very few things that are real for you. I'll give you an example. A child wants to touch everything. You tell him it's hot, don't touch it. Right? And then he touches it when you're not looking. He puts his hand in a flame when you're not looking and he burns himself. Now it registers in his brain that the fire is hot. Try to get someone that's an adult to put their hand into fire. You won't be able to convince anyone to do that because it's a reality for them that fire burns. I'm not gonna do it. It's not just a knowledge. For a kid, it could be a knowledge. But for a person that, that has experienced the pain, it becomes at some point, it's wired like this in their, in their life and it's wired that if you do it, you burn. It's a reality. 
it's not just an intellectual piece of knowledge that fire is hot and therefore you shouldn't touch it. It's a reality that you don't even have to think about it twice. And a person could take any piece of knowledge and turn it into reality for their life. And that is the mitzvah of emunah. The mitzvah of emunah is not just to believe that there is a God. The mitzvah of emunah is, you have to make it a reality that you live with. Dr. Shmarchu has, has created and does govern the world at every moment of any day and every aspect of a person's life. Of course, I'm not trying to get into what is exactly providence and what it includes. That's a very large sugya with a built-in um, debate and machloket between the Rishonim, the, the Ramban, others of how that operates. But in a general sense, to understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists and I live every step and every minute and moment of my life with that awareness, that is the mitzvah of emunah. Not just to know, okay, I know HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists, check, no. That's only the beginning. If you only do that, you have never done, established a mitzvah of emunah in your life. Rambam, when he speaks in uh, about mitzvah of emunah, he says, also, you have to have yidi'ah and it has to become a reality. That there is a creator, a God that has created everything and so on and so forth. The mitzvah, again, you have to put the Arabic thing that it was written together with, with the Hebrew translation, uh, a different shiur for itself, but the mitzvah emuna is v'yadata yom v'ashevot ha'levavecha. Now I want to borrow that term for what Mr. Hashem is trying to say here. What he's trying to say is she'yit barer v'yit amit. It's not merely enough to have clarity of where you're headed in life, but it has to become your reality because if it doesn't hit the reality, you won't live your life based on just the mere knowledge that you have. You won't. It's a guarantee that you would not live your life like that. You could find around yourself thousands of people that they know things that they should be doing, but they don't do them conveniently. Why not? Because there is yidi'ah, there is yitbarer, but there is not yit'amit. It's not v'hashevot ha'elevavecha. There is a disconnect between the brain and the heart. They say this about, about Esav Arasha. Esav was a massive tamih hacham, right? You see, Rabbi Aaron Cutler once was visiting a, um, a cheder, a Jewish school, and they had for preschoolers, they had this, uh, this picture of Esav uh, with a, an eye patch and stitches all around and, and like a clean shaven that like, looked like one of these gangsters. And he asked, said, who is this? They said, Esav. Said, Esav didn't look like this. Esav had a long beard and peot and a stripe. <laughs> he, he knew Shas Balpe. He asked the, such nitty gritty detailed questions. Chazal said Rashi he brings the Midrash of Ketzat Masrin HaMelech, Ketzat Masrin HaTevin. How do you, do you take tides of, of Tevin, of, of, of straw and of salt? He, he was a Tamir Hacham. But when he went out, it was complete disconnect between his mind and his heart. He not find find himself bound to the intellectual convictions that he had. There was no conviction, intellectual information that he attained, and that's why. Where is his head buried? With Yaakov Avinu in Arata Mechbrad, because there was a disconnect between the head and the body. It happened like that in his burial as well. Right? It's a cute point, but it, it delivers the message of a person, of all of us. Right? Let's be open. All of us that we have certain things that are knowledge based, we know them, we believe them 100%, but we don't do them. I try to explain why don't you do it if you believe in this? Because the way human body and mind works is when you attain something, now it starts. The, the, the process now just started. It didn't finish. Now you have to start trickling this down from mind to heart to make it a reality. To live with that conviction is the hardest part of the job. I challenge you to find 10 things tonight that you believe them to be right, but you don't do them. You know you should be doing it. That's, you know, preparation for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur upcoming. That's the beginning of the process of tshuva. 
Find things that you know you should be doing, why you don't? Why? Because she eats barer, is clean, but it amit is, is not, hasn't started. So it therefore says that Amchal, the foundation of everything, the root of any growth and any connection with Hashem is, you have to first have clarity, but the clarity has to become a reality. It has to be a reality of your life. You know, when Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky in his, in his Musu Sefer that he wrote, in Orchod Yosher, he speaks about Yirat Chet. He tries to explain what's Yirat Chet. What do you mean? You're afraid of sin? It has to be Yirat Hashem. What's Yirat Chet? What does that mean? We, we talk about and he brings like maybe 20 Chazals, uh, Gemaras and Zohars and, and Midrashim that talk about Yirat Chet. So he asks the obvious question, so what do you mean Yirat Chet? It makes no sense. It has to be Yirat Hashem. You're not afraid of the sin, you're afraid of Hashem who said don't sin. Then he says no. That's for Yidi'ah. He doesn't say it like this, but I'm explaining to you what he tries to say over there. That yes, you have to understand that this is a wrong thing to do and therefore I don't want to do it because Hashem said so. But that's not sufficient. That's not a high level necessarily. High level is when you look at the sin and you see cancer. You run away from it like a person would run away from fire. You're afraid of it because it has turned into a reality. For you, you realize that there is a reality of sin. And it's the cancer, you run away from it. You know, when, when they had this radioactive um, plant that blew up and then they had to clean it and everyone that went there died immediately. They, they didn't realize what the, 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 the power of the radioactive um, contamination was there. The miles away, still you would die pretty much immediately. When they realized it, imagine if you would read those things of people who went to clean up and they died instantly. Within days, hours. And then I would try to convince you to go there. So I'd give you a thousand dollars. Okay, five thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars? Maybe a million? Can I pay a price that you would do it? No, because it turns into a reality that this is death. Now imagine if a person would look at Chilul Shabbat like that. Imagine if a person would look at eating a bug like that. Something that the Torah, Torah said this is Asur. Hechod Nida. You name it. Things that may be an intellectual conviction, but the person does not necessarily feel like obligated. It's not to be super careful. Ah, it's, it's like, you know, I take a pass on this with Lashon Hara, maybe? Hafez Chaim counts up to 31 Lavim and Asim for Lashon Hara. Death. It's cancer. <laughs> that's Yirat Chet. I believe that's what Chaim Kanievsky is trying to say in Orchot Yosher. But this is what he's certainly saying over here. She eats barer, we eat amid. Now, we're not talking about specific mitzvah or avera. We're talking about a person's global life goals. What am I spending my life on? I've been given health and a life on this planet. What am I doing? You have to have clarity and then you have to take that clarity and trickle it down that now it becomes, it turns into the reality of your life. You see how I said it 10 times. I'm trying different angles to clarify this. Is it clear? There is Yidi'ah, but then there is Amitud. When, when something becomes the reality that I live with. It's not just mere intellectual piece of information that I contain in my, my, my um, bookshelf over here but something I live my life with. And then he says, I think these are the most fundamental things that he says here. What's his obligation in his world? Pay attention, does not say what's the obligation of a person in, in the world? But what is your obligation in your world? Because your world is different than mine. You've been born with a family with a, a, a certain set of talents and also foibles and challenges, shortcomings and strengths, family dynamics, emotional composure, 
midot, all of which makes a person who they are, and the people who surround you is your olam, and your chova, your obligation in that world of yours has to be defined as a custom made, personally tailored to you as the person that you are. In other words, there are many things that are objective truths of Torah. Right? Someone that says, oh, for me it's too much. Anything that has been written in the Torah by, if you think for just point zero zero one second, you'll, you'll understand that if the Akash uh, Baruch Hu is gave, given this on Har Sinai and has obligated every Jew to do that, given that they are not considered schizophrenic and, and mentally ill, then that means that it's, cap it's, it's cap within capability of every human being to do those that Hashem expects it. So that is simple, but that's not, that, that's the objective truth of the mitzvot and the Torah, of let's call it 613, let's call it 620 plus the 7, the Rabbanans, fine? But that's not enough for this, for our discussion, because that's not the whole obligation that you have. You can't just say, okay, check this box, check this box. Every person is extremely unique in the way they have been, and your challenge and my challenge are very different. You almost cannot find two individuals that they share the same exact thing in the world. Like the Mara says, Just like the faces of people are different, their deot, their mindset, which defines a person, the mind defines a person, is also different. Have you ever seen two cows, all the cows, to me at least, they look the same? Right? All the monkeys look the same. Right? Human beings are extremely different. Now, let's put it, even if you want to disagree with that, let's identify a little bit differently. Even if you have identical twins, that they share the same DNA, their print, their fingerprint is different. Why? No two people have ever had the same fingerprints. The way I say it, I like to say it is because your print on the world is different. How you impact the world is, is ought to be different because you are an individual with your individuality, with your things. And you have to fine tune that to know exactly what, what is my goal in my life. To try to live a life of somebody else is a failure from first moment. To compare yourself in that way is to ignore your own obligation to yourself in your own world. So you see how amazing at the same time dangerous this is. You have to be very careful not to follow necessarily other people's things. You have to be honest with yourself to understand what is what am I doing in my life and for that you have to first understand yourself if you don't have a good understanding of who am I you can never get to macho you have to be brutally honest brutally honest with every foible every shortcoming and also every strength a person that, that plays humble on something that they actually have and could be and they don't actualize it because they're already better than other people, so they just take a pass on that, they have done the greatest disservice to themselves and to the world. Because that's not what you are. You could have been much bigger than that. And the, way, the only way a person could know is you have to go through a process of self-examination and to find yourself. It's a soul search in the highest level that the person could ever have and that's the basic greatest obligation that the person has to themselves what is my obligation in my world and that has to be clear it's barrier and that has to become a reality it amit 
You see, these are four words that he says, but the, the entirety of a person's path in life are summarized and encapsulated in these four words. This one sentence that he writes, the first two lines of Mislad Yishalim Perak Aleph, should be etched on gold and, and put on, on top of every person's house and, 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 and life, to live life with this. But it doesn't end there. Once you have clarity, now you have to get to work. What do you have to focus your mabat and your megama? So what does that mean? Mabat means an outlook. Megama means a, a goal. So why are these two two different things? It's very pashrut, very simple. I'll give you a story of somebody that was, was actually doing a research um, and he went to different schools drawing a point A and point B on a sand and asking the students with a stick to draw a straight line from point A to point B. So everyone was standing, trying to go, do as, as straight as possible, but when they got to the end, either it was off or even if it was on, you saw a zigzag in the line. Until one, one kid came and he, he drew a straight line from point A. As they asked, said, how did you do it? They said, well, everyone else was looking at where they were. You can't draw a line from point A to point B like that. If you want to draw a straight line, you have to have one eye here, one eye at the, at the, at the, at the goal end, every second. That's the only way you could do it, because your brain is, is doing the comparison. That's mabat. You have to have an outlook on life of what is my long-term goal, and reevaluate yourself with that every second. So the analogy I made for this, which I really like is a GPS analogy, right? We just call it God's positioning um, system, right? And what that is, is every GPS needs four things to operate, right? You need to have a location of where you are now. You need to have a destination that you punch in. Where are you headed? Then you need to have a knowledge, a deep knowledge of all the roadmaps of where they they end to be able to, to to decide what's the shortest way that I could get from point A to point B and what if one of them is blocked and I have to get a detour and then the most important one is you have to know you have that for sure that's not the GPS that's for you have to know the most important is you have to have satellite connection at every second. You go on a tunnel, it's a satellite lost, the GPS is worthless. Which means, now let's bring this down to our life. You have to know where you are. That's Makhovato Baulamo. Right? Who am I? What are my shortcomings? What are my challenges? What are my strengths? What are my goals? Where am I headed? That's the goals. Where do I want to see myself when I'm retired, 65, 75, 85, when I'm on that hospital bed, looking back, flashing, my life flashing in front of my eyes? What do I want to see from bird's eye view on that tombstone? It's a painful, brutal, honest question. Right? If we could fit a few pages on that tombstone, what would be those things, right? That's your destination. What's the shortest way from where I am there? And then every second of life, and he's going to spend a lot of time on the Gemarayin, Masakat Baba Batra, of Vata Valker Yomrua Moshlim Bo Cheshbon, of Cheshbon Anefesh. A constant satellite connection. Where am I? Where am I headed? Am I on the path? That is what he is saying. That's Mabat. You have to have a general outlook of where am I headed right now? Where am I headed next? What's my one year plan? My five year plan? My 10 year plan? Where am I headed? Without having a Mabat Klali on life, 
you are going to be lost guaranteed. You're gonna take this detour, you're gonna see a beautiful waterfall, and you're gonna get, you know, you see a, a, a wedding here, you get, get distracted with this, you get distracted with that, and before, before long, you're lost. Completely lost, or partially lost. It takes away from a person's actual accomplishment of that goal in a very short time. In other words, our life is limited. As long as it should be 120, it's very limited. You know, you want to know how limited this is? Think of the following. It's an exercise I give to myself, and I share it often with people who are there. I think out loud. Think of something that happened to you 10 years ago. Close your eyes for five seconds. Think of something that happened to you 10 years ago, something major that happened to you 10 years ago. You have it? How fast did it pass? How fast did it pass? For someone it could be graduation, for someone it could be wedding anniversary, for someone it could be having the first child, for some bar mitzvah. How fast did it pass? The usual answer you get is a blink of an eye. And people mean it when they say it. It's quick. Now, until 20, your life is not as meaningful necessarily. Yeah, you're maturing still. You're taking um, lessons of responsibility in life. And after, let's call it 70, but let's be very generous and say 80. A person is on a very quick path down. You don't feel, you have pain, your mind is not as clear, even if you remember things, you don't have Alzheimer's and dementia and, and this and that and the other, and the other and the other and the other. So you have six of those blinks. How many of them have you passed already? It's a pretty scary thought, because it's going. It's going quicker than you could think. And if you want to do, what it takes to actually have a meaningful life. So then, you have to be on, on your game, all hands on the deck, every moment of your day. Now this sounds brutal, but it is, so it, that's, that's what the life of a person is. Kol yemei hayav, every day of a person's life. Behine. And what Chazal tell us is, what our sages have taught us is that the person has been created in order to achieve the goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to be davek, to, to, to draw the closeness and the pleasures of the spiritual um, goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that they are the greatest that you could ever imagine. Now, in order to understand this, first of all, the Gemara says, "Har mitzvah behay al maldeka." Right? We have this in, in many different forms. The Gemara says in Avodah Dazara, we recently had in Daf Gimel, right? In the beginning, the very onset of Masechet Avodah Dazara, that says, "Hayom la asotam, velo hayom, velo machar la asotam, hayom la asotam, velo hayom lekabel scharam." That today you do them, but tomorrow tomorrow of time, that means after a person passes on, in Olam Abba, there is no ability of doing mitzvot. Hayom la'asotam velo hayom lekabel scharam. Today is not the place of accepting schar for the mitzvot. Why not? Why? Well, Hashem is stingy. Why can't he give some of the schar over here? And the, the, again, the way I explain this, which would speak to an intellectual mind would be um, what I say to, to my children when they start um, learning the, the, uh, the chart of multiplication. I tell them, look, what, what, okay, what, what's one time infinity? It's infinity. How about half a time infinity? What's half a infinity? No, it's infinity. Point one infinity? Point zero, 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 and say 50 zeros, one infinity is also infinity. Any fraction, as small as it may be, multiplied by infinite, it's infinite. Infinite means you cannot fathom what that is. 
Now, Olam Abba is not finite, it's infinite. So you do the minutest mitzvah, minutest, smallest thing in the world, and that is infinite. You cannot fit possibly anything of infinite in finite. Is that clear? You cannot fit infinity in finite finite world. It doesn't fit. It's, imagine if you go to a there's a, there's a example that I heard from um, I remember from who I think one of the students of uh, Ramosha Shapira. He said, imagine you go to a kiosk and you want a bottle of water for fifty cents, and it's in some remote town somewhere in Africa and you drop a check for 10 trillion dollars I said can I have my change back that's what it's, it, it would look like if you want to cash a mitzvah as small as it may be in, in, in the currency of the pleasures of this world let's say this in one more way imagine all of the pleasures that the, the richest most um, in a luxurious person in the world has had in his entire life. I right? combine them day to day, minute to minute of a lifetime of pleasures, right? Now don't stop there. Go through the pleasures combining all the pleasures of every one of the 8 billion plus people who live now. Right? You have it? Combine all of them. And now don't stop there. Go one generation back and another one, and another one, since the day the world was created until now, combine all of those pleasures, that does not come even close to what it means to have one mitzvah, because that's infinite, this is finite. This you could confine in confine, as big as it may be, but it's confined. That is not confined. Infinite by its nature is not confined. Now the purpose that Akash Baruch Hu created the world is Mimidat HaTov Le'tiv, like Zohar HaKadosh says, like the Ramchal spends time um, more so than here in his Sefer Dat Tvunot and also in the summary of that in his Sefer Derech Hashem and he actually explains the mechanism of that um, and how it works with free will we will at some point in future in Yisrael in, in, touch on that and explain it the way he explains it in his other writings but for our purpose of a few minutes that we have left the purpose of the creation has been for a person to benefit from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. now that only could happen over here like the Mara says in Masechet Nida Tav Samech Alef Ama Rabbi Yochanan my dichtiv what does it say when it says Lametim Chofshi it says Kevan Shemet Adam Nasa Chofshi Mina Mitzvot once the those eyes close at the end of life, your Chofshim, you no longer could do a mitzvah. Nothing. They say the Vilna Gaon, the Vilna Gaon, if it would be to sit and explain the greatness of Vilna Gaon, Hasman Yichle Ve'emalo Yichlu, who we know in, not enough time for hours and hours and hours. Imagine a person that knew everything. You know, everyone knows Ashrei, right? Ashrei, Ashrei, everyone knows it by heart. Try to say Ashrei backwards. The Vilna Gaon could do that with the entirety of Torah. Everything that you know that exists. Can you imagine a capacity of mind that could do that to Shas Bavli, Yerushalmi, every single one of the Rishonim, Akronim, Zohar, the Sifre Kabbalah, and not just the memory, but with deep understanding. And that's just the beginning. He knew all the Chochmot of the world, including music and... Uh, And he was at the end of his blessed long life. He was holding his sitziot and he was crying. I told him, what haven't you done? What haven't you written on? What haven't you taught? You've, you've had the most blessed, fulfilled, amazing life. He's like, you don't get it. Until the moment I'm here, I'm wearing this tzitzit, you buy it with a few dollars and every second you're getting a mitzvah doraita. The counter is counting. Every moment. It's a loss of opportunity. Once you're gone, it, it's, it's gone. 
the opportunity of doing mitzvah for somebody that appreciates it and he lives a life with the currency of mitzvah people have different currencies right what you know and, and the currency is what defines your life right some people's currency is money they every decision they make is based on okay it's a financial um, consideration right it's what you give versus what you get every person has a different currency in their life if when you look at the world and we'll explain this again at the different different point in time but when a person looks at life with the prism of the, the currency of mitzvot the life is so precious so precious every moment of it is precious and we'll talk about difficulties in life and the value of those things at some point as well but let's not get it complicated the life itself as an opportunity to do what you think and you know you have to be doing that the time of it is here but the pleasures that you can seek and you, you could have from closeness to Akos Baruch, which is eternal and infinite is only there in Olam Abba. So you have a very interesting dichotomy and, and Ramchal says it the, the closeness to Akos Baruch Hu is the Ta'anug Amiti is the only true Ta'anug the only true pleasure so let's just ask a question on this. Does that mean that the pleasure of shish kebab is not Tanuk Amiti? Going to a five-star hotel and a ten-star uh, travel to, I don't know, Bahamas and whatnot, it's not Tanuk Amiti? That's the only Tanuk Amiti? I would venture to say that's exactly what he means. Let me explain this for a moment. I believe everything that we call pleasure it's not really pleasure is escape from the routine of life it means when you are living a life and things become mundane as they always tend to to become a person for the nature that we have and of course work has created us sometimes you need a change of scenery and that change is needed for refreshment of a person's mind you need sometimes to just take off and speak to someone. Like the Vilna Gaon, he says in actually in the sixth parak of Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, when uh, the, the Mishnah there counts 48 different pathways to acquirement of knowledge. And one of them is Mi'ut Sicha. The Vilna Gaon says Mi'ut Sicha doesn't mean don't talk too much. It means you must talk with people a little bit. You can't just sit and learn the entire time. It, it blows your mind and you become not productive. A human nature necessitates a certain interaction. So the like our rights. So here's the same thing. Sometimes you need a change. And you go on a trip. You provide yourself a change. And that you know feels good. But that's not pleasure, real pleasure. Because if it was real pleasure, the more of it you would have, the more pleasure you should have but it's not like that try to stay in Bahamas or Hawaii for two weeks three weeks four weeks four weeks at some point you become sick and tired well, well the Hawaiians where do they go for a trip they go to Hawaii no they come here we go there because everyone is escaping the reality of their routine for a change so that is not real pleasure it's not it's a change of routine it's not intrinsic pleasure. Intrinsic pleasure, you, you should not be able to get sick of. The closest thing to real pleasure, and there's reasons for this, because it is an extension of real pleasure, is a person's child, children. You never get sick of it. And that's because there is a continuity of eternity in that. And that causes a person to, to uh, the, the subconscious understanding of the eternity that the child presents is why it's so pleasurable. But that is basically it. In all the other things that we call pleasure, ta'anug, try to have the best steak in the world three times a day for two weeks. And let's see if you can look at it even. Can't. 
So Ta'anuk Ha'amiti, the real Ta'anuk, that the more of it you have, the better it is, is Le'it Aneg Al Hashem. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that if you um, research actually this, you'll see that the people who are the upper echelon of the community, of the, the, the highest level of affluence, they have the highest rate of attempted and actual suicide. Which doesn't make sense, really. Because it should not be like that, right? We would not think that that should be the case. But it is because you feel a certain sense of emptiness when you feel that this is not real. You have had the, the private jet. You've been into the travels. You've had the best food. You've experienced the best hotels. How many travels can you go to? At some point when everything becomes mundane, you realize that this is empty. This is not what life is about. And that feeling of emptiness is, is the greatest level of depression. If you research this, and I do encourage you to do so, you'll see the highest levels of depression is in those highest levels of, of, of community. So that is what the Rambam is saying. The place of this pleasure is only Olam Haba. Because again, things in this world are finite and they're not real pleasures. And especially because a person has been given an eternal neshama, the, the, the quest for that pleasure and seeking meaning is part and parcel of our um, existence. If you don't believe in, um, in spiritual a religious, so to speak, source of, uh, of contentment, then you'll turn into isms and cults, right? You, you, take, you turn something into a meaning for yourself. Communist, the original communism or socialism, it was a, almost like a religious thing. They believed in it. It was not just a thing. Because that's a quest of a person, the way, the way we are created. We, we look for meaning beyond physics beyond the physical, uh, you know, regular, mundane, finite world and life that we have. So says the Mishal Sharim, the, but the way to achieve that is only is only here. Here is the, the platform, the, the, the place that you could achieve. Again, as we mentioned, after you die, it's finished. Right? It's papers up. You cannot write anything. You cannot do anything. You can't accomplish anything. Well, there are um, r residual and also passive income. In other words, if people are still doing things because of you, positive or negative, you still um, get counted in your cheshbon, but you cannot do anything after 120. That's what the Mishnah says. This world is like a hallway and Haolam Abba is like the trackline. and Haolam Abba is the the hall the wedding hall this world is a passage it's a passage that you need absolutely a necessity to get to you cannot there's no other way to get to the trackline to the hall but it's a passage it's a pathway it's nothing more than a a, a prose door Right, you pass through it, it's a short few decades, and everything that you need to acquire that is only available over here. This is something that we're going, going to explain at length, the, this whole analogy that the Mishnah makes between Prozdor and Traktin, Bezrat Hashem, in, um, in, in the next Shurim. Chazak Baruch.